The consensus viewpoint from the guests that I've talked to, and even many economists who have appeared on mainstream media, is that a recession is now more likely than ever. I've heard various estimates on timing from a few years away to we're already in a recession. The medium estimate on timing, at least on my show so far, is quarter four of this year to quarter one, 2024. Naturally, the negative outlook on economic growth has been coupled by deteriorating sentiment in the equity markets. Now, I'm not saying everyone I've talked to so far has been bearish, but I would say that the majority has been, to the point where bullish forecasters have been called contrarian. Despite overwhelming bearish sentiment, the stock markets just continue to climb the wall of worry higher. Year-to-date, the S&P 500 is up 13%, and the Nasdaq gained 27%. So with that in mind, I'm going to today highlight a compilation of five of the most bullish analysts and traders I've spoken to over the last two months and how much the markets have gained since each of these interviews. So here they are in chronological order of recording date. I'll put links to the full interviews in the description down below. I highly encourage you to check them out. And as always, like this video if you find the content useful, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe. So the first guest I want to highlight is Jason Shapiro, principal of JS Trading. I did this interview with him on April 21st, and since then, the S&P 500 is up 5%. Jason goes against the crowd, so if the overwhelming sentiment is bearish, it only makes sense to him to be bullish. Once the consensus view is that fears of a recession are behind us, then it's time to start selling. We're coming into the summer, which tends to be more of the sell in May and go away type of thing. Um, but I am certainly still long stocks as I have been all year. Um, and I don't see anything at this point that is taking me out of that position. So I, I still think that there's still upside to go and to, that has to be completed here. I, I remember, uh, some of the criticism you got when we spoke last time it wasn't just your market call, but I think I asked you about the economy and back then you weren't super bearish on the economy. You had said, you know, we're not entering a super doom and gloom scenario like some others were predicting. Have you changed your outlook on the economy since three months ago, four months ago? I think my ability to predict the economy remains the same as it was three or four months ago, which is not particularly good. I'm not any kind of great economist or anything. You know, I understand the basics of economics. I've been gone to school and paid attention to that, but my ability to predict the future of the economy is no better than or worse, I would say, than than anybody else's. M my thought process at the end of the year last year was that everybody in the world was predicting recession coming. So therefore, as a contrarian, the risk reward trade is to play for not recession. Whether there's actually recession or not is almost irrelevant to me. It's really what the market does. You know, I saw a guy um, who has been bearish all year and he's a public guy. So he, he talks about his stuff all the time. And the market was flying in his face and flying in his face. And he was short and short and short. And he came out and said, you know, the truth is I've been right about everything this year except the stock market. OK, that's wonderful. So he's been right about the economy and he's been right about this and he's been right about that. But who cares? You know what I mean? He's been short the stock market and that's been going up. And that's the only thing that matters as a trader, right? I'm not trading the GDP number. I'm not trading a contract on the CPI number. I'm trading the S&P 500 or whatever, right? So that's what I need to predict. Um, so that was the idea about the economy really at the end of last year was everybody was so discounting in this recession that was coming. That to me, it was over discounted and the play was to play no recession. Um, and, you know, so far that's been the case. Does that mean there's not going to be a recession? Doesn't mean there's not going to be a recession. Some of the numbers are looking pretty weak right now, although some of them are not looking weak. So I can't really tell you what the economy is. I can't tell you what anything's going to do in the future. But personally, I can't um, I can't really predict whether there's going to be a recession or not. I, I just play the markets. I believe that until the idea of this recession is given up on, the market is going to go higher. And once they give up on this recession idea, then the market will top. Okay, but Jason, wh why is it that over the last four months, the markets have been rallying despite what you said, everyone was bearish, super bearish, predicting a recession. I, I don't understand this sort of juxtaposition. You got a rallying stock markets, but 
people thinking the economy is going to suffer. Why? That is why, because they're all short. So the market rallies when everybody's short, right? Because they get squeezed out. Nobody, it's just like the people I was talking about that are underinvested in the real economy. People are also underinvested in, in the stock market. I mean, go out and find me one person who is massively leveraged along the stock market here. Um, I can't find that person. I'm sure maybe they exist somewhere, but everybody I hear on TV and all the commentators I hear, um, they hate it. Now they might pick and choose. Okay. You got to be in energy. You got to be in consumer staples or whatever, but people do not think that this stock market is, is going higher. Um, and therefore they're just getting squeezed. It's a consistent squeeze of shorts. That's just as a contrarian. That's how I see how the market works. The market goes up because people are, are short and underinvested and the market goes down when everybody gets too long. To me, it's that it's really in a way that simple. Um, so that's why it's going up. You're saying, why is it going up despite the fact that they're all bearish? I'm saying it's going up because they all bearish. I'm sure without even having seen all of your interviews that the vast majority of people that you have on here are bearish. Okay. Um, because, because the vast majority of the people that I see on all these interviews are bearish. So why would, you know, it's the subset of the people that you have on be any different and quite frankly it's what makes sense you know uh you have to be bearish because of what's happening but that doesn't mean that it's right you know what i mean the market climbs a wall of worry and the reason the market climbs a wall of worry is because when everybody's worried everybody's short and when everybody's short the market rallies I, I I need to come back to this i'm trying to wrap my head around your philosophy here you you just said it makes sense to be bearish but you're doing the exact opposite. I yes. mean, you, your, your, your results speak for itself, but I, I yes. just don't understand. Why, why would you do the opposite of what makes sense? Because the market doesn't make sense. Okay. okay. It, it never has. It never will. Um, and, and that's what being contrarian is all about. And that's why when you get back to your original question, I started doing the opposite of what I did my first 10 years. My first 10 years, I tried to do what made sense and it didn't work. Okay. So after that, I decided, let's try to do what actually makes money, right? Um, and what it turns out, I think what makes money is really doing the opposite of, of, of what makes sense. Because in particular, when everybody can see what makes sense, because then it's discounted in. The market is a discounting mechanism. So if everybody knows to be bearish, then they're short. And if they're all short, the market has a good possibility of going up. And certainly the upside is going to be more than the downside. There's no guarantee the market can go down, but the upside is going to be a lot more than the downside. And that's what you want to be in trades that pay you more when you're right than, than pay you when you're wrong. My trading has less than 50% profitable trades. So the game is not getting it right. The game is having bigger payoffs when you're right than when you're wrong. Next is hedge fund manager Thomas Hayes, managing member of Great Hill Capital. I spoke with Thomas on April 27th, and since then, the S&P has climbed 6%. His bullish thesis is that the Fed will pause rate hikes, which turned out to be correct, the dollar will weaken, and an improvement in earnings in the second half of this year will come, which will push the markets even higher. Let's just talk about uh, smart money positioning here. I was reading a note uh, earlier this week. Uh, this is from the Commitment of Traders Report. And uh, it revealed that the, um, I'm just going to read this note, the number of net derivative contracts on the U.S. Uh, T 10-year note, so U.S. Treasury 10-year, dropped to a record negative uh, 1.29 million in the week ending April 18th. Hedge funds are increasing their short bets on uh, U.S. Treasuries. Uh, this is the largest uh, bear position on U.S. Treasuries uh, in a while on record, actually. So, uh, you know, what, 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 what's the sentiment right now? Is that, yeah. is that a bullish position on equities or, or is that just risk on or risk off? Yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely perfect as a matter of fact, because um, large speculators and hedge fund positioning commitment traders is often a contra indicator historically. So what they're all betting on is that the Fed is going to go longer and more aggressively uh, than we think is going to be the case. And if they're, and that's how they're positioned. In other words, bonds down yields up. They're short bonds. Um, 
historically, this has been an acute point where the exact opposite happens. Uh, speaking to your point about commitments of traders, because this is something that we follow very intently, um, hedge funds are also the shortest that they've been uh, for over a decade, uh, going back to 2009 again, in terms of S&P futures, in terms of Russell futures, they're very short, uh, in terms of even Dow futures. so And usually when they get short, if you want an indicator as to a pred more predictable indicator, and it depends on instrument by instrument, but you follow the commercial hedgers and they tend to be early and they tend to be right. Commercial hedgers are getting aggressively long the S&P, aggressively long bonds, uh, and uh, which, which implies a compression in yields and normalization. And that would actually follow with our, our bullish thesis where with rates normalizing, the Fed pausing, the dollar weakening, uh, earnings coming back, and a reacceleration in the back half, which the market is sniffing out. And that would force the market higher and push all these people in cash back into the market at the exact wrong time. So uh, we, we think a lot of the stars are aligning uh, for the wall of worry to keep, you know, continue to climb the wall of worry. Uh, we, we are, you know, we did get a hair overbought in the short term. We had that move off the uh, lows in March. So we're, we're kind of consolidating here, waiting for direction. And, and now it looks like pushing back through today after we got through what everyone feared, which was tech earnings. And, uh, and they came in so much better than expected. And people just simply weren't positioned for it. So I'm guessing today's uh, rally had more to do with tech earnings and the lower GDP data. I, I think unequivocally. I, I think uh, certainly the lower GDP data, you know, you didn't want a 3% hot number going into a Fed meeting, right? <laughs> and come, out, come through the other side with a 50 basis point hike. That would be devastating for, for the stock market. Uh, but that was kind of already known, David, in that uh, yesterday or the day before, Atlanta GDP now took their Q1 estimates down from 2.5 to, I think, 1.1 or 1.0. So, the market kind of knew that, and it was uh, soft in recent days following the F, uh, the uh, First Republic saga that never ends. So, uh, so no, I think this is a function of earnings. I think this is a function of uh, some of the guidance, some of the rhetoric coming out of managements and just seeing beats across the board, whether it's the, the big banks, certainly the smaller banks were a little bit of a weight, uh, tech, some of the industrial companies. I mean, across the board, it's just even if they're not taking guidance up, they're not taking it down. We didn't have the pre-announcements, which I was talked to about quite a few times uh, before the year's earnings season started. I said, I, I just don't think it's going to be that bad. And you haven't seen any pre-announcements and, we're, you know, banks are going to report in a few days. And that's been the case. They're, they're not taking down the guidance. Uh, some of them aren't taking it up, but they're not taking it down. And that is... Uh, much better than expected. And as they say, David, the secret to happiness in life is low expectations. And that's certainly what we came into this earnings season with. I think Warren Buffett had a similar quote about marriage, uh, but that's another topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Thomas, let's finish up on uh, your expectations for the Fed and then finally market. So uh, how many more rate hikes are we getting uh, this year after next week? I think that's it. I think it's okay. going to be one and done. I think they're going to get to their terminal rate what would be beautiful if this thing is still lingering? I mean, if they if they get First Republic resolved over the weekend, then they might have an impetus to raise and say, "We'll see what happens next." You know, see you next month. But if that thing is still lingering and uh, lending is re lending at these regionals is contracting, you see it in the numbers. Uh, it, the surprise would be if they said, "We we hit our terminal rate." We're now at an elevated level. We intend to stay at an elevated level for the foreseeable future. We reserve the right to hike again if inflation resurfaces. But for now, uh, we're going we're gonna to take a pause and see how this works through the system as the data is already showing us that things are slowing, both in, in uh, the labor market is loosening, which was our intent. Uh, wages are, are uh, decelerating, which was our intent. Red are decelerating, which was our intent. So, so we have, we have, you know, mission accomplished and reserved the right to go back to the well. I think the market would be very surprised. And what makes me think that that's a reasonable probability is the way that no one is positioned for it, and that would be uh, maximum pain given the amount of cash and the amount of people in treasuries that would have to scramble up five, six, seven percent. I spoke with David Hunter, chief macro strategist of Contrarian Macro Advisors, on May nineteenth. And since then, the S&P is up 3.5%.
David isn't fundamentally constructive on the economy long term. In fact, he says a global deflationary bust will happen, and that will crash the equity markets by 80%. But before then, the S&P 500 is going to melt up to 6,000 to 7,000 points this year, which would mean a 60% rally in the coming months. His reasoning is unique, and I encourage you to watch the full interview. Link in the description down below. Aside from raising the rates, what other policy tools uh, do governments have to combat high levels of inflation? Yeah, well, that's I mean, it's cranking down the money supply. It's shrinking the money supply that ultimately will will have, um, and they'll they'll put in. Unfortunately, you'll see. Uh, and by the way, just stepping back and answering the other question, uh, if we're so well off, think about how universal income is becoming ever more a popular proposal, right? We're seeing states talk about it. We're seeing the government, federal government talk about it. So, so in terms of standard living, we shouldn't be, if we're really that well off, we would not be seeing universal income as a, as a, you know, thing that is being pushed. So, but anyway, going forward to what, what will happen when inflation moves up to counter it, you, you will certainly see the Fed having to tighten at some point, but that'll come down the road, um, you know, several years into it, you will probably see um, uh, um, some sort of, uh, you know, they'll try, they've tried it back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they will try to put caps on prices and think that but that always ends up with even higher prices. If you if you try to fight the, the markets on this, and put caps on things like oil or whatever, ultimately it'll break through that and it'll fail. So I, I there's certainly going to be, you know, some sort of limits put on things, um, but I don't think they're going to work. Now for, for the investors, what does this all mean? And, uh, you know, you're calling for a melt up in the, in the, in the short term. So I, I guess we should still be invested for now is what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't make, uh, I, I don't give advice, so I'll leave that to others. But what I can say is that um, I my my call is for six to seven thousand on the S and P this year, and probably probably by the end of the summer uh, could could stretch out. My so my M O is that I I put uh, possibilities out there, and they just keep ex, you know they keep extending. So you know this is a big cycle, but I'm I'm calling for something that's unprecedented in terms of it's a it's called a melt up for a reason. We're at the end of a 41 year secular bull market that started in August of 1982, um, and I believe we're coming to the top of that this year. That last stage of that is probably going to be vertical. So it might take you know it's taken its time getting to the old high of uh, 4,800. But I think once we exceed that 4,800, you're going to see a very fast ramp up. And and because so many people are bearish and are assuming that we have to go lower before we go higher, I think at some point as the tape keeps moving up, you're going to see momentum build and you're going to see that the markets are fairly thin, meaning with everybody on one side of the boat, having been bearish and now turning bullish, I think you're going to see a very rapid uh, move into the market. As people say, I got to reposition back bullish. And I think you're going to find that prices move up rapidly because there's, you know, everybody's on one side, uh, meaning they go from all the sellers to all buyers. Um, and so it won't last long. It's a, it's a final parabolic blow off. And then I think we got to deal with the bust and, you know, the market will start discounting that. Okay. And during a period of double-digit inflation, whether it be 15 or 25 percent, which assets do you think could survive that? Yeah, great answer. Uh, great question. I, I believe the next cycle will be dominated by commodities. And I believe gold and silver are, I'm calling for gold to go to 20,000 by the end of the decade. Uh, I think it can go to 3,000 this year. I'm calling for silver to go to probably four or five hundred by the end of the decade. Oil could be at four or five hundred dollars a barrel by the end of the decade. Um, 
and you know copper will be through the roof natural gas will be through the roof you know all commodities ag commodities will see you know substantially higher highs than they've ever been um we will see a commodity cycle unlike any we've ever seen i think commodities will be the the game in town um and i think if you're in indexes if if interest rates go from zero to 15 percent over a five or six or seven year period um indexes are very much driven by PE multiple expansion or have been in this last 41 year bull market. If you get the reverse of that, um, you're going to see PE multiple shrinkage, you know, contraction. And so indexes are going to have a hard time getting back to the highs of this year. So I think the highs we set this year in this final blow off will probably be the highs for decades to come. And that um, so there'll be an opportunity in sectors of the market, commodities being the most commodity producers being one of the big ones, but also things that feed the commodities like, um, you know, the, the miners need equipment. So the equipment makers will do well. Um, industrial in general will do well. What will probably uh, lag will be consumer. You know, but whether it be consumer basic or consumer discretionary, I think the consumer is going to have a hard time. Those are general comments. That doesn't mean you won't have, you know, a consumer stock that doesn't do well. It doesn't mean technology can't have advancements that do well. But in general, it will be the commodity sector. And by the way, semiconductors are a commodity. <laughs> so I think if you're in technology during that recovery period, after the bust, um, the area in technology that probably will will thrive will be will be semiconductors. Doug Pita is the next guest. He is the chief U.S. strategist of BCA Research. He says that the economy is not currently as weak as some may think, and he pointed to a number of indicators, including continued strength in U.S. consumption, as consumers still have the assets to sustain aggregate demand. His research finds. His thesis is that the strength in consumption will, quote unquote, stave off a recession until 2024. And he's recommending an overweight position in equities until the S&P 500 reaches at least 4,500 points. I spoke to Doug on May 22nd, and since then, the S&P is up 4%. Investors might ask you, Doug, does it matter if or when we're getting a recession? Meaning, is there a definitive relationship between the S&P 500 and economic growth? So just because we're going to get going to get a recession, does that necessarily imply we're going to get a bear market for sure? Definitely not. It, look, that's an astute question that that someone who perhaps worked at BCA might ask. Um, it, the economy we do say all the time internally at BCA, and I'm sure you'll remember this over and over. It's like a, a mantra or a refrain: the stock market is not the economy. But a thread that binds the two of them together is corporate earnings. It's S&P 500 earnings. To me, it does matter in the near term for making investment decisions as to whether or not the recession arrives before investors expect, when investors expect, or after investors expect. Given Forecast for economic growth, if you go to Bloomberg in the ECFC screen, economic forecasts, that provides the consensus expectations of a lot of economists, it's 50 or 60 economists. For the second quarter, the one we're in right now that we're halfway through, the expectation is that U.S. GDP is going to grow a tenth of a percent in inflation adjusted terms. This is quarter over quarter and then annualized and seasonally adjusted. For the third quarter, the number is minus 90 basis points or minus nine tenths of a percentage point. And for the fourth quarter, the expectation is minus three tenths of a percentage point. That is the very definition of a recession. So that to me says consensus believes the recession has either already begun or it starts right now. That recession expectation has the consensus of economists looking for microscopic growth in calendar 2023, somewhere between zero 
and 0.5% real. I'm suggesting that the U.S. economy can grow one and a quarter percent, one and a half percent real in 2023. That's really tepid growth. Right? That is short of the 2% trend growth rate that has been in place for a while. But one and a quarter to one and a half versus zero to 0 0.5 is a pretty big gap. And as if my base case is correct, and that expectations gap closes, I would expect along with the pickup in economic growth will come a pickup or in economic growth expectations will come a pickup in S&P 500 earnings expectations. And that tying this change in the economic expectations and the corporate earnings expectations, the S&P 500 earnings per share expectations together with markets the final piece is that I believe the marginal price setter in public securities markets is the professional asset manager who is judged on his or her relative quarterly performance. So that any asset allocator or multi-asset manager who has preemptively gotten underweight equities is going to be feeling some performance pressure to hold on to the assets his or her firm manages, or to hold on to his or her job to get back and catch up. Additionally, equity managers, I would expect, who have gotten preemptively defensive, are going to have to rotate out of the most defensive sectors, consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare, and back into the most cyclically exposed sectors, energy, industrials, and materials. And that that is the you know that's the basis for the market view that within our group at BCA, the U.S. Investment Strategy Group, that we are recommending with a three-month time horizon, so a tactical time horizon, that multi-asset investors, overweight equities, and underweight fixed income. Now, you know, we think the S P five hundred can get to four thousand five hundred at some point this summer. We are overweight equities and underweight fixed income in, in preparation for that. The instant we get to 4,500, if it does, we will cut equities from overweight to equal weight and raise fixed income from underweight to equal weight. And we'll be chomping at the bit for the best opportunity to go underweight equities and overweight fixed income with a maximal overweight in treasuries and with as above benchmark duration exposure as any individual manager can stand in hopes of riding or in preparation for riding the 10 year yield down from around 4% to two and a quarter, two and a half percent, catching that move from our view is going to be the key to generating outperformance over the next year or two for any asset allocator. Finally, the next guest is Brian Payne, Chief Strategist of the Private Markets and Alternatives Service at BCA Research, whom I spoke to on June 9th. Since then, the S&P 500 is up 2%. Brian told me that, quote-unquote, an impending recession in the coming year or two is likely, and that growth is going to surface up as the main problem going forward. But a recession before a year from now is unlikely. Because of this, and more importantly, because a large number of economists and investors believe that a recession is coming sooner than that, there's been a record number of short positions accumulated on the stock markets. Brian shares Jason Shapiro's view that if the crowded trade is short, you'd want to bet against that, which is to be long. The best hedge funds in the world, uh, what are those managers doing or how are they thinking that separates them from the rest of the crowd? So I'd say it's three things we look at. The process. So process is very important. We don't think it adds as much alpha anymore, just given technology, AI, et cetera, but very important because you need to have that process and it needs to be repeatable. The other two ones, risk management and portfolio construction, that's where that cleverness comes in. That's where that uniqueness comes in. Everyone can own Apple, but are they owning it and what kind of quantity are they long short it? How are they constructing it with the other parts of the portfolio that 
when their conviction is wrong or when they're wrong on certain calls, how's the other side of the portfolio kind of balancing it? And that's the beauty of it. That's where that art comes in. And that's where the alpha is going forward is in the portfolio construction. And then risk management is very similar is how you kind of pulling those levers within portfolio construction. How are you prevent, how are you limiting your, your wrong, how are you limiting your wrongs? How are you maximizing your rights? So that's how, you know, that's really where that alpha is coming in going forward here. Have you noticed um, uh, an increase in shorts in a particular sector from hedge funds recently? Well, I think you've talked about it before on some of your shows is the amount of short interest on the SMP, particularly E-minis, and it's just a sample size. When you look at CFTC data, everyone is short, at least from what we're seeing there. It's been one of the uh, one of the most short shorted environments there is out there. This is why we see equities going up right now. It's just too hard for them to go down if everyone's short. How do you know a bottom when no one's left to sell? Well, if everyone already sold, the only thing they can do is buy it back. So that's one of the things we see out there. And then I think another one you pointed at was the short interest in uh, shorting U.S. 10 years. So everyone still thinks rates are going up, which you know they could be, but we don't think that upside is or we don't think that risk is still there to be shorting like they are. So you're seeing a pretty lop, lopsided market right now in terms of positioning. Um, that you know we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But if everyone's short short equities and everyone's short rates, the opposite's probably going to occur at least in the next you know six to nine months. And that gives us a little bit that gives us a little a little bit of concern for more of the macro managers, some more of the short interest. Uh, excuse me the hedge risk mitigation strategies. And that's why we do like those equity long short managers is even those betas are going to carry them up as equities kind of melt up a little bit. Given what you just said, I'm guessing you're leaning more on the long side of things. If you were to invest yourself, you were to bet on the S&P going up before a reversal. Is that a fair assumption to make, Brian? Uh, I am long the S&P and I'm lever long the S&P, at least over the next few months. All right. Fair enough. Um, is there a particular, I guess, inversion point or um, catalyst that you would be looking for uh, before you change your mind? Well, similar to like we talked about earlier in the show, I'm waiting for everyone to get extremely positive. And anytime you talk to someone out there, and that's our, whether it's our clients, other investors out there, when everyone says we're long equities, we're very positive, that's when it will probably roll over. Whether I, I, that's I this year or early next, we'll, we'll say. Somebody tweeted that uh, it came up on my Twitter this morning. Um, it was a collection of news articles from various financial media about how the bull market is back because the S and P's already risen twenty percent. Um, not everybody is bullish, but certainly we're seeing that reappear in the mainstream media. Are you seeing uh, more of a mix in sentiment, or uh, like you said, every, most people you're talking to are leaning more towards the bearish side? You are seeing a mix. I've seen a lot of macro individual, a lot of macro managers more recently, particularly ones that are probably flattish on the year, aren't as deep into the negative territory, starting to build those short positions back up given more recent pricing. We think that's somewhat of a mistake, just given, again, how short the market is, where sentiment is. Yeah, those stories are coming up, but it doesn't mean folks have acted on that. It doesn't mean those flows are have come or are already behind us. We expect those to start coming, especially with those stories and those headlines from the retail sector. When my friends start calling me up and saying, when should I start selling stocks? Well, then we'll kind of start talking. <laughs> All right. So where do you think the markets are headed from here? Comment down below and let us know your thoughts. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe.